What is Christianity? Part 6. Historical Evidence. The above discussion shows manifestly the extent of the conflict between the theories of Jesus and Paul. And also demonstrates that the basic tenets of modern Christianity are not part of the teachings of Jesus but have in fact been formulated by Paul. Paul is the founder of the doctrines of Trinity, Incarnation, Redemption, the Last Supper, non-adherence to the Torah and abrogation of circumcision. We would not be unjust if we said that Paul is, on the basis of the above historical evidence, the founder and originator of Christianity. However, it is desirable that further historical evidence elucidating this claim be presented. For that purpose, we have to study the biography of Paul, even if reliable material thereon is limited. Moreover, the Acts of the Apostles, the letters of Paul himself and the writings of Christian theologians will be referred to in corroboration of this claim. Journey to Arabia. We have already stated that Paul was a Jew in origin. He later claimed faith in Jesus. If he truly brought faith in Jesus, then it followed logically that after this spiritual transformation he ought to have spent as much time as possible with those disciples of Jesus who acquired their learning directly from Jesus, and who were the greatest scholars of Christianity at that time. However, the life of Paul demonstrates that immediately after his spiritual transformation, he did not go to the disciples at Jerusalem. Instead, he went to the southern regions of Syria. In the letter named Galatians, Paul himself writes, but when he who had set me apart before I was born, and had called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me, in order that might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I sent away into Arabia, and again I returned to Damascus. Galatians 1 15-17. What was the reason for going to Arabia? The Encyclopedia Britannica states, Paul quickly saw the need to stay in a quiet and peaceful area where he could reflect over his new position. Hence he went to the southern regions of Damascus, the main problem facing him was to interpret the law and the teaching of Jesus in a new form in the light of his own novel experience. The well-known Christian historian James McKinnon says in his excellent work Burkitt, Volume 3, p. 148. If you read the account of the Last Supper in the Book of Mark, you will not find any order directing th ah, it be observed in the future. But St. Paul when referring to the Last Supper adds the following sentence which the ascribes to Jesus, do this in remembrance of me. From Christ to Constantine as follows. At his conversion he, went away into Arabia, Nabataea, apparently to think out the implications of his new faith, rather than to preach to the Nabataeans. It was only three years later that he went to Jerusalem to visit Peter and James, the Lord's brother, presumably to consult them on the tradition about Jesus. The question is why did Paul undergo three years of seclusion after bringing faith in Jesus? Why did he not acquire learning and benefit from those who had benefited directly from Jesus? Has not the answer been clearly given by the above quotations which are to the effect that Paul did not wish to adopt the teachings of Jesus which were regarded by the disciples as Christian? But he wished to give the Christian faith a new form. For that purpose he required time for reflection in a place of seclusion. His purpose was to replace the pristine religion of Jesus with a new religion for which he desired to use the name of Jesus. A well-known biographer of Paul F.J. Fakes Jackson interprets this act of Paul as follows, McKinnon, p. 91. Moreover, he believed that he was acting under the direct guidance of God. As he told the Galatians he had gone to debate with the older apostles at Jerusalem by revelation. Later the spirit of Jesus as will be seen, directed his mission on its journey. In choosing Silas as his companion he was doubtless acting under the belief that what he did was God's will and he returned to the scene of his former preaching with an evident determination to carry his message as widely afield as God would permit him. A little consideration will show that this conclusion is irrational. In the final analysis, he asserts that the spiritual status of Paul reached such a height that he was not in need of the training of any disciple in order to understand the teaching of Jesus. If by means of this extraordinary Step, Paul had proclaimed the same message which is established through the disciples and the gospel, then to a certain extent this interpretation would have been acceptable. But, you have read before that Paul expounded a theory which was in direct conflict with the teachings of Jesus. In such a situation, there must be some proof to the effect that Paul received from God instruction in such doctrine, whereupon the previous form or expression of Christianity had been abrogated. 
In the absence of such proof, is this naked claim of such merit that it should form the basis of revolutionizing Christianity? Moreover, if there were to come immediately after Jesus a revolutionary disciple, why did Jesus not give any indication or information of such coming? Yet, according to Christians, Jesus informed about the descent of the Holy Spirit at the time of the Pentecost, an event which was not revolutionary in itself. But he did not inform of the coming of Paul as a messenger. The conduct of the disciples towards Paul. An objection may be raised to the effect that if the claim of Paul were wrong, and that instead of following Christianity, he was distorting it, why did the disciples of Christ assist Paul? The answer to this question requires explanation. Our research reveals that Paul did not immediately on meeting the disciples propound his revolutionary theories. But that in the beginning, he came to them as a sincere follower. Hence, the disciples assisted him. But, as he began gradually to introduce changes to Christian beliefs and attack its basic conceptions, the disciples separated themselves from him completely. Unfortunately, we have only two means of determining the situation of that time. One is the letters of Paul himself, the other the book Acts by his student Luke. Both are clearly insufficient and not free from Paulian influence. Notwithstanding, it is not difficult to conclude on the basis of these two means together with other historical evidence. That there were extremely serious differences between Paul and the disciples of Jesus. In order that the reality may emerge, we shall review the relationship of Paul with different disciples of Jesus in sufficient detail. Paul and Barambas. The first of the twelve disciples to meet Paul after his spiritual transformation, and to stay with him for a long period, was Barnabas. What was his status amongst the disciples? This appears from the following statement of the Acts. Thus Joseph who was surnamed by the apostles Barnabas, which means, son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field which belonged to him, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Acts 4:36. This was the Barnabas who certified Paul as true before all the disciples, and showed them that Paul has become like them in belief. Whereas until that time, the disciples were not certain of this. Luke writes. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him, and brought him to the apostles, and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. Acts 4:36. This was the Barnabas who certified Paul as true before all the disciples, and showed them that Paul has become like them in belief. Whereas until that time, the disciples were not certain of this. Luke writes. According to the Acts, both Paul and Barnabas were companions for a long period, and both preached Christianity together, see Acts 11. 25, to the extent that the other disciples testified in regard to them as follows. Men who have risked their lives for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 15:26. Until the 15th chapter of the Acts, both Barnabas and Paul are portrayed as closely connected in all matters. But, thereafter, an event suddenly occurs which requires special attention. After staying together for such a lengthy period and jointly undertaking the task of preaching and propagation, there arises suddenly a very serious dispute between the two to the extent that it was not possible anymore for both to stay together. The event is narrated by the Acts in such a manner that the reader does not even suspect of this before. Luke writes. And after some days Paul said to Barnabas, Come, let us return and visit the brethren in every city where we proclaimed the word of the Lord, and see now they are. And Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia, and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp contention, so that they separated from each other. Barabbas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Acts 15:36-41. The Acts ostensibly attribute this serious dispute to the fact that Barnabas wished to take with him John, Mark, and Paul refused. In our view, the cause of such a serious contention cannot be such a small matter, but this permanent separation of the two must certainly be ascribed to fundamental differences. The following supports this. 1. The Greek words employed by Luke in the Acts to describe the separation and contention are unusually severe. Blakelock in his commentary to the Acts, writes Folks Jackson, p. 129. Luke who honestly writes of the difference between the two companions, Paul and Barnabas, used a very strong word, paraxusmus. 
which has been correctly rendered as sharp in the English translation King James Version. Again, a very strong word for the Greek language has been used for separation. Is it true that such a serious difference which necessitated the use of drastic language arose simply on the basis that one person desired to take with him John, M-A-R-K, and the other not? Such differences and disputes are not infrequent in their occurrence. But, they do not result in permanent separation of close companions who especially are agreed on the noble and holy objectives on which such companionship is based. At this juncture some of the followers of Paul indirectly seek to blame Barnabas. By insinuating that he sacrificed his friendship and religious objectives by seeking to take with him a relative. John. Call Mark Blakelock, p. 118. Luke is the student of Paul. It should be considered whether Barnabas, who according to him, was amongst the leading figures of early Christianity and who devoted and risked his life in the propagation would for the sake of a relative sacrifice the noble objects of propagation. The simple truth is that the difference of opinion between Paul and Barnabas was theological. When Barnabas saw that Paul was altering the basic doctrines of Christianity, he separated himself from him. And Paul's pupil, Luke, has explained the difference in a manner that if blame were to be apportioned, then blame would be leveled at Barnabas, and Paul would be free of fault. 2. Then the nice thing is that Paul later accepts the companionship of John, Mark. In the letter to Timothy, too, he says, Get Mark and bring him with you for he is very in serving me. Tim. 4.11. In his letter to the Colossians, he writes, Aristarchus my fellow prisoner greets you, and Mark the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions if he comes to you, receive him, Colonel. 4.10. We learn from this that the difference between Mark and Paul was not of serious importance. Paul accepted his companionship later. But, now where in the New Testament or in any historical book is there reference to the fact that the relationship between Barnabas and Paul was restored? The question is, if the cause of the dispute was Mark, then why was the relationship between Paul and Barnabas not restored after Paul had accepted Mark? Three. Nowhere in he letters of Paul is it stated that the cause of the dispute between him and Barnabas was Mark. On the contrary, we find one sentence, which throws some light on the dispute between the two. In the letter to Galatians, Paul writes. But when Cephas came to Antioch I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before, certain men came from James, he ate with the Gentiles. But when they came he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party and with him the rest of the Jews acted insincerely, so that even Barnabas was carried away by their insincerity. Gal. 2, 11. In this quotation, Paul refers to the differences amongst the Christians which appeared in Jerusalem and Antioch after the ascent of Jesus. The majority of the inhabitants of Jerusalem and Antioch after the ascent of Jesus. The majority of the inhabitants of Jerusalem were Jews, and it was only later they embraced Christianity. The majority of the people of Antioch were polytheists, and embraced Christianity after propagation by the disciples. The first group are referred to in the Bible as Jewish Christians, and the second as Gentile Christians. The Jewish Christians asserted that it was necessary to owe circumcision and to act on all the laws of the law of Moses. Hence, they were also called the circumcised. The Gentiles however, asserted that circumcision and the like was not necessary. The result was that the Jewish Christians who regarded as unlawful the slaughter of the Gentiles, did not like to eat and intermingle with the Gentiles. Paul was the founder and upholder of these views of the Gentiles. He made these endeavors in order to obtain support from the Gentiles, and to ensure that their views were same as his. In the above except from the Galatians, Paul criticized Barnabas and Peter for this reason, namely, that both supported the party of circumcision whilst staying in Antioch and separated themselves from the new followers of Paul who did not uphold circumcision and the law of Moses. Consequently, the Reverend Peterson Smith writes, Loenic, p. 50. Peter used to sit mostly at Antioch with those who came from Jerusalem, and who knew him before. Hence, they concurred with him very quickly. Other Jewish Christians were also influenced by Peter to the extent that Barnabas also began separating from the Gentile Christians. This form of conduct affected these new Christians and Paul tolerated the position as far as possible. But very quickly he began opposing it even if that meant opposing his colleagues. It is apparent that this event precedes by a few days the separation between Barnabas and Paul. 
because the coming of Peter to Antioch was a little after the meeting of the disciples in Jerusalem, and there is not much distance. In time between the meeting of the disciples and the separation of Barnabas, Luke has narrated both incidents in the 15th chapter of the Acts. Accordingly, it is most probable that the sharp contention between Barnabas and Paul referred to by Luke in strong words was due to these fundamental theological differences and not so much to the companionship of John Mark. Paul did not consider necessary for his followers circumcision and abiding by the law of Moses. And Barnabas was not willing to overlook the law which was greatly emphasized by the Bible, and in regard to which there was no possibility of abrogation. Hence, Rev. Peterson Smith also perceives this aspect namely that the cause of separation of Paul and Barnabas was not simply Mark, but serious theoretical differences. He writes, Barnabas and Peter who both were great persons must have admitted their mistake. Hence, the problem would have been resolved. Notwithstanding, the possibility remains that there were differences between them which became manifest later. As if the Reverend concedes that the basis of the separation of Paul and Barnabas was theoretical differences. Council of Jerusalem. At this stage, an objection arises. It is stated in the 15th chapter of Acts that the disciples met in Jerusalem and decided that he Gentiles only be invited to embrace Christianity and that they be not required to abide by the law of Moses. Apart from Paul, Barnabas, Peter and James were also party to this decision. Then, how is it possible for Barnabas and Peter to differ with Paul on the ground that Paul is not regarding adherence to the law of Moses and circumcision as compulsory for the Gentiles? If Peter and Barnabas held a view contrary to that of Paul, then they would not have issued a ruling the meeting in Jerusalem to the effect that the Gentiles were not bound by the law of Moses. This objection appears sound. If, however, recourse is had to the conditions and circumstances surrounding the meeting at Jerusalem, and the circumstances relating to the separation of Paul and Barnabas, the objection is dispelled. Our research reveals that the decision of the Council of Jerusalem to exempt the Gentiles from adherence to the law of Moses was taken in the light of the prevailing circumstances. The decision was not meant to exclude the Gentiles forever from adherence to the law of Moses. It appeared that adherence to the detailed law of Moses was an obstacle to the Gentiles of the time in embracing Christianity. They were afraid to embrace the Christian faith because they would have had to abide by the law of Moses. Some less learned people had explained to them that both bringing faith in Jesus and abiding by the law of Moses was necessary for salvation in the hereafter. If the law of Moses was not acted upon, salvation could not be obtained. Hence, Luke writes. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brethren, unless you circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Acts 15 1. It is clear that this instruction was wrong. Circumcision and abiding by the detailed laws of Moses, although compulsory in the Christian faith, was however not a prerequisite to faith, and nor could it be made a basis of salvation. If a non-Muslim refuses to accept Islam only on the basis that he will have to undergo circumcision, what will be the position of the scholars? Will they exclude him from the fold of Islam on the basis of circumcision? Clearly not in such a situation, the non-Muslim will be told that the order of circumcision whilst necessary is not the basis of salvation. Hence, he must adopt the cardinal beliefs of Islam and for that purpose he will not have to undergo circumcision as a condition precedent. The effect is not that the law of circumcision has been exempted in relation to non-Muslims. The meaning is simply that the non-Muslim is saved from kufr disbelief. The same procedure was adopted by the disciples. Hence, when the matter was discussed at the Council of Jerusalem, it was unanimously decided that if the Gentile could not endure adherence to the detailed law of Moses, they nevertheless be allowed to embrace Christianity by accepting the basic tenets. This is clearly supported by the following statement of Peter at the Council of Jerusalem. Now therefore why do you make trial of God by putting yoke upon the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we shall be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Acts 15 10-11. Is not the clear meaning of this excerpt that some of the detailed rules of the Torah are so difficult to act upon that they and their forebears could not fully act upon them? Notwithstanding, they are people of faith and desirous of salvation, then why can the Gentiles not leave some of the details of the law and still bring faith and hope in salvation? Peterson Smith, p. 88-89. One must bear in mind that the Council of Jerusalem did not discuss the question are the laws of Torah obligatory on the Gentiles or not? 
The question under discussion was must the Gentiles be ordered to abide by the law of Torah or not? Our research reveals that there was no difference of opinion amongst the disciples on the obligatory nature of the law of Torah. All agreed that this law was in itself obligatory. Debate centered around the question that experience showed that Gentiles would not be able to act upon the details of the law, hence, why should propagation not be restricted to calling them to accept the cardinal beliefs? For this reason, Luke describes the condition of those who considered adherence to the law of Torah necessary, as follows. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up, and said, It is necessary to circumcise them, and to charge them to keep the law of Moses. Acts 15 5. In reply, James stated his judgment as follows. Therefore my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the pollutions of idols, and from unchastity and from what is strangled and from blood. Acts 15 19-20. The council wrote a letter to the Gentiles stating therein, For it has seemed good to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what is strangled and from unchastity. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. Actes 15:28-39. The above quotations clearly indicate that the disciples did not render the law of Torah as abrogated. But, in order to accommodate a great need, they allowed the Gentiles to accept Christianity without the need to adhere to the law of Torah. Reverend Manley writes. On their return Paul and Barnabas learn of the debate cantering around whether the non-Jews could be admitted to the churches on adhering to the prescribed conditions. This was common in Antioch, and Paul and Barnabas followed this principle during the course of their journeys. And non-Jews were admitted to the churches without being subject to circumcision or the rituals of the Torah. However, the Jewish Christians belonging to the Church of Jerusalem were adamant that these conditions be imposed on them. Paul and Barnabas as leaders of the delegation from Antioch were sent to the Council of Jerusalem. The Council ruled that such conditions must not be imposed on the new converse who were not Jews. To foster unity between the Jewish and Gentile Christians, the Council laid down that the Gentile Christians should avoid meat dedicated to idols, blood, meat of strangled animals, adultery, and that they should observe the high morals of the Law of Moses, Torah. It is clear from the above that the purpose of the disciples was not to abrogate the law of Torah insofar as the Gentiles were concerned, but that their purpose was not to impose any condition for their entry into Christianity. This was the original position of the disciples which was announced at the Council of Jerusalem. Thereafter when Barnabas and Paul went to Antioch, Paul explained this announcement of the disciples by teaching that all the laws of the Torah were absolutely abrogated, and that those laws were a curse from which they had been released. Gal 3, 13, now, there was no need to act on them. It is clear that the acceptance of this claim of Paul would overturn Christianity. Hence, Peter and Barnabas opposed Paul at this juncture, and Paul describes this as follows. But when Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he ate with Gentiles, but when they came he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party and with him the rest of the Jews acted insincerely, so that even Barnabas was carried away by their 